I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Matthew Wallstrom. Matthew is a, he's actually got quite a diverse background as a patented inventor. He is a uh, real estate, full-time real estate agent and has his own clothing brand. So I'm um, sure we'll talk a lot about all of those things. Uh, thanks for coming on the show today, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So why don't you just go ahead and tell us your background? I know there's, there's a lot there, but uh, maybe walk us through the, through the story. Sure, sure. Well, I was uh, I was born and raised in Southern California, kind of 30 minutes from Malibu Beach. So I was, had a very privileged upbringing with uh, being that close to California beaches. And um, I think as a kid, I was always very artistic. That was all something that just sort of stuck with me. I was kind of, you know, staring at the butterflies and drawing when I probably should have been paying attention in class. But those were just that artistic side of things seemed to resonate with me more as a, as a child and carried on into my adult life. So I have always been in some form of sales and marketing training job career path, something that involved design, sales, marketing, people skills that was kind of always present. So retrospectively, the things and the skills sort of that I developed as a kid of the, those artistic side of skills and the people skills really played sort of an integral role later on in life and in the career paths that I that I did choose and that I ended up in um, currently. So um, I spent 15 plus years in the fitness industry, uh, everything from a personal trainer to running health clubs to running a consulting agency that uh, traveled around and worked with health clubs all around the country for sales and acquisition, um, you know, talent acquisition, putting ancillary services in place that would help generate revenue for them um, and was in that business for a very long time. And I got to see the good and the bad and the ugly of it. And at the end of that, there was this crescendo of, of events that happened that um, kind of pulled me from the arms of corporate America and made me realize that it was, it was really time to invest in myself and, uh, and, and bet on myself, because I, I came to the realization that if I was not willing to fail, I had not much to worry about. If it was on my shoulders, then I knew that I could kind of persevere and keep going. However, if I was in a corporate setting, there were things that were just out of my control, right? I could do a great job. And for financial reasons, that company could decide next month that they needed to sell and they could drop me. And, and that's just the, the way of the world. So that sort of got me on a path of really going after um, my passions. Uh, when I, I got married very young, around 25, um, and had my son very quickly after that. Um, during that process of being a new dad, uh, I, I ended up coming up with a uh, invention for a bottle that allowed users to keep baby formula and water separate in one bottle. And this click collar that we have our patents on um, really keeps that separate and allows the that to be mixed whenever you want. And so we have, so I spent years in development of that, um, which then kind of spawned into a fitness bottle version um, that you can see here that we are getting ready to uh, launch this year. So that was sort of a uh, a side project that was a real passion of mine that that was always in the background, no matter what I was doing throughout my life, the the, the steps forward of continuing to try to get, bring this bottle to uh, reality and, br and bring it as a, as a product to the market, um, which was extremely challenging for a multitude of reasons, which we can get into later, but, um, but it was always kind of going on in the background. And so it took you know, 14 plus years to get to a point where we are actually, you know, now at the brink of being able to launch this and uh, give it to the world, which would be an amazing accomplishment um, and, and a ton of hard work that took to get there. Um, so that was going on. And uh, in about 2009, I really got interested in real estate and from mostly even from an investing standpoint, flipping houses, looking at rental properties. There's such a wide range of, of opportunities within the real estate space to make money that it almost, you know, 
gives a, a lot of uh, range for people to figure out what their niche is going to be, what they really you know gravitate towards, and what they could do, whether they're licensed or not. Um, and we had just moved back and had sold our previous house. And that money from the sale of that house really afforded me the opportunity to kind of break into the real estate market. Because as you know, it's, you know, you go from high paying commission jobs and, and salary jobs to the world of working for yourself and being your own employer. Um, and real estate takes time to ramp up with clients and your business recognition, getting it all out there. So I was able to then break into the real estate business which my wife and I have a, uh, a team within our brokerage. And we've been doing that for about the past seven years. And about three years ago, um, I created a brand called Epic Roll BJJ, which is a jujitsu based lifestyle clothing company. I myself have been a jujitsu practitioner for 16 years. I'm a jujitsu black belt um, under the Tom de Blas Association. And um, so that was a very unexpected but beautiful thing that that came uh, out of doing jujitsu because I had something that I was so passionate about that now I could turn into a revenue source and really allowed me to connect with people all over the world thanks to social media. Um, so that has been a, a really aggressively growing uh, company that has been amazing and probably, you know, one of the ones that I'm, uh, I'm most proud of, uh, because it, it came out so organically. And I think based on the feedback we've gotten at this point and the growth of the company, it's really showed me that there is a market for this and it has been well received by the community. So I've continued to push on with that. And these are really the main uh, companies and revenue streams right now that I'm focused on until we can continue to, to grow and, and continue to pursue some of my other uh, passions and, and goals. Yeah. I mean, that seems like enough. I think you, you say you say you said that as if uh, you, that wasn't enough things that you were focused on. But uh, no, I, that seems like seems like a lot. And uh, I mean, a really cool uh, sort of diverse set of skills. And and I mean, fortunately, been able to turn those into you know sort of revenue streams. So that's that's really awesome. Um, I'm interested in kind of I guess. So you said you started in real estate in 2009 and now since then you you have a real estate a real estate broker team with your wife correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And, and let's let's talk a little bit about that. Like how did you get started? What what sort of how did that evolve? Yeah, so I always found it very interesting. It was just again one of those things that I from an outside perspective seemed interesting um but it also seemed like everybody was a real estate agent. So I kind of was a little bit concerned with how do I stand out? And I knew that I had a strong background in marketing and really uh, real estate from just a residential perspective. And with most businesses, such a relationship business, right? So we're at a point where after doing it for um, the length of time that we've been doing it, we're very fortunate to have a lot of uh, repeat business and a lot of referrals from our previous clients, which is very important. So our relationships that we build with our clients are extremely important because they really feed our business as we continue on and we reinvest in them and, and are obviously very grateful for, um, you know, to have that. So, uh, so we, when uh, about 2009, when we sold that house, I was kind of at a point where it was like, do I go get another corporate job or do I take the plunge and, and break into this? And, because of the schooling and the little requirements of, of what it took to study, I had to have a little bit of a financial cushion. I mean, they do have a lot of different op opportunities for people, whether they do them online or classes in person when you're first getting started. But I was well aware that and having real estate uh, friends that there was going to need to be a little bit of a cushion. I had just had my second son at this point and just bought a house and there was just a lot going on. So I really couldn't, uh, you know, just casually walk into this industry without being a little prepared and, and and be able to do it successfully. So right out of the gates, I, as I mentioned, I was very interested in the, um, the investing side of real estate, the opportunities with rental properties, with working with investors and flipping houses. And in my area, in Northern Virginia and DC, the market, it's very expensive. So out of all the homes that we've flipped, I would say the the lowest I think I've ever paid for a house was maybe three forty five, um, average 
four hundred to five hundred thousand. That's you're buying half a million dollar house before you even put any money into it to flip it. It's it's you know my first house was in Alexandria and we bought it for four fifty, put one hundred and seventy five thousand dollar renovation into it. Took six months, and um, I think we made about sixty five thousand on that deal which was great, right? It was like our first deal. So it was, so it was, a, it was a good one, but the guy who wholesaled it to me made 90,000, just handing me the, uh, the paper, yeah. which was a really, you know, that was perspective right there. I went, wow, I'm wholesaling. That's interesting. You know, that seems <laughs> like, uh, it, and it's not an easy business. Obviously you have to have a lot of systems in place and, and, uh, really be aggressive with your marketing and, and all of that. But it was, it was, again, it was an interesting, uh, thing to, to see. And so it, that kind of led me into this path of trying to flip you know, as, as many as we could per year, but not making that my full blown thing. Cause I, I just recognize that, um, the market goes, it, it peaks, there's valleys, there's ebbs and flows. And so I kind of wanted to have a structure that allowed me to be diverse to where I had the residential side going. I worked with investors and had, you know, those people, I had some flips that we could do every year. So in a way I was, I was diversifying within real estate to kind of cover all my bases to give us you know, the, the biggest chance of keeping it interesting and doing fun projects, but also, you know, the financial backing. So, um, so that really got us into it. We really loved it. My wife actually came in as a transaction coordinator with our brokerage at first and really learned the back end of the business. So we had a very symbiotic, very good relationship with that, where she would handle and keep me in, in order and keep everything organized, which is something I'm really great at. And, uh, and then I could go in and deal with kind of the front end of the business and, um, you know, customer acquisitions and, and, and dealing with the, the hard sales side of things and negotiations, um, which was obviously a big part of my background. So um, that brought us to this. And honestly, it's, it's a business that I love dearly. I think it's very challenging, but I think it's also very gratifying and can be very rewarding. And it's one that you definitely get out of it, what you put into it. So as long as you're not complacent, as long as you're willing to work hard and um, put the time in, you, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, one thing you mentioned, you, you sold the house in 2009, which wasn't a great time to be selling a house. Uh, so uh, you, it sounds like you were able to do that and, and actually still take some money out of it. I know a lot of people in 2009 were uh, uh, selling for a loss. So that was a, a good thing for you. Um, oh, yeah. And then, you know, so you, you sort of built this business, kind of brought your wife in, and you are you still investing? Are you still, what are you doing at this point? Are you essentially uh, brokering for other people? What's your, what's your focus? So the focus right now is still growing the residential side. We have a lot of clients that, you know, in working in DC, Virginia, and Maryland, we have a lot of government uh, clients as well. So it was important to have that, uh, the license that goes in that area, because there's a lot of mixing bowl areas where, where somebody could work uh, for the government and live in DC, Virginia, or Maryland, because each one of them could have some areas that, that kind of would work. So, um, so that's a big part is just really growing our residential business. I think eventually we hope to find ourselves uh, in some warmer climate, perhaps down in Florida, where my business partner for our bottle is, and um, and eventually I'd like to take our our client base and be able to work with some uh, local agents around here to be able to kind of hand that off and continue to grow. It's, we've spent a lot of time, money and effort to grow it to this. So to just walk away, you know, and just hand them, but I mean, that would be silly. So, um, so really I, I, I enjoy it. I'm very fortunate in a sense that I get to work with a lot of uh, friends and family. So it makes the, the experience, um, that much more enjoyable. Um, so, and with the investing, we will just look for opportunities casually as we can find them, because I believe firmly that you have to stick to your numbers and it's very easy in real estate to get emotional. I think I probably wrote 35 offers um, before we got our first house under contract uh, to flip. And so that can be a daunting task that in the middle of it, you start to justify things. You start to justify numbers and think, oh, well, I could maybe make it up here. I can make it up there because just you're wanting to get going. You're wanting to just pull the trigger. And so it's, you know, it's very important to stick to those numbers because that's your first real safety net. I know a lot of people that have lost big time, not sticking to their numbers, letting themselves get emotionally attached to it. Um, and, and that's where you can potentially run into trouble. So we kind of had very conservative 
uh, margins that we would stick within and say, if we were spending half a million dollars on a single family house, we wanted to make sure we were making at least 50 or 60,000. When you're leveraging that much cash, it really just doesn't, everybody's, uh, I guess, perception of, of profit maybe, and what they want out of it is different. But for me, you know, it was just too much cash to just casually throw around to, to not be pretty sure that we're not going to, you know, have too many issues and being an, a real estate agent, it gave me sort of a, a perspective. It wasn't just an investor. It was, I could see it from both sides. So I could look at the house and really do extensive work on comps and knowing what the market was, was asking for at a certain price range and everything from the floor plan to the finishes. Um, which I find a very fun process. I love taking something that's old and dilapidated and making it beautiful new and, and, you know, getting a new happy family in there. It's, it's a, it's a really cool process, um, to go through, but it, but it can be very scary and it doesn't come without its pitfalls, right? I've had crazy things happen. I've had homeless people break into our houses and break windows and ha have just, you know, a slew of, of things, but I really have been, um, pretty fortunate that I haven't had any huge financial losses from it. Cause I, I listened to a lot of bigger podcasts, po uh, podcasts. When I first started, I'm listening to everything. I'm like, man, you know, you almost scare yourself out of doing it. Right. Um, but my wife and I did a, we were, we were referred from a guy named, uh, Rob Chavez, who's a real estate mentor of mine, very successful guy, um, out of the rest in uh, Keller Williams office. And, uh, great guy. And I really leaned on him a lot for advice in the beginning and breaking into this, especially on the investing side. And um, he had told me about a, a going to this real estate investing course. It was like a weekend type of a course. And you hear a lot of those. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out which ones are good and which ones are just trying to suck people in and steal their money because there's definitely a lot of those guys out there. Um, but I was get coming from a, a referral from somebody who I trusted and, and valued. I thought, cool, we'll do it. And the, the kicker was that you paid $1,500 to do this course. But when you did your first flip, they actually gave you that check back. They had a little ceremony, they give you a check back. And I knew I was committed to, to making it happen. So I thought, great, that means that I can go in and really learn from these guys who my mentor values, uh, do what I intend to do. And then in the end, you know, which kind of makes you believe in yourself. In the end, I got that money back. So I was able to do it with, you know, zero dollars out of pocket and just the the experience of going through the process. Cause there's a lot, there's a whole lot to, to know. It's a very glamorous, sexy business, right? And you can see from an outside perspective why it would be fun and exciting. They got reality shows about it, but without really having a good understanding, without doing your research and really becoming fluent in that language, it, it can be very challenging and you can lose a lot of money if you're not careful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's a, I mean, there's a lot of really good points there in terms of, you know, getting started and, and making sure you've got the right mentors. Cause yeah, I, I, I actually, at one point did one of those courses where you, they basically just want your money and it's not, <laughs> it's a, it doesn't really teach you anything. And it's uh but, but it, you know, you, you get maybe a little bit desperate to, to get started somehow. And these things mm -hmm. pop up and you're like, yeah, sure. I'll go to your weekend course. And then they're like, give us a little more money. You can go to this other course. So it's, it's easy to get wrapped in. You have to do your due diligence on that. But um, one of the things I feel like comes up a lot, you hear people ask this question is, should I get my real estate license if I want to invest, particularly in, in residential, you know, and, and I've heard it argued both ways. I wonder what's your, what's your take on that? I think it really comes down to the amount of business you plan on doing because to be a realtor in this area, usually if you want to have it actually be a benefit to you, you're going to have to join an association as well. So you're going to have to go through the normal course of action to get your license. Then you're going to have a year to, to hold it and pick a, what broker you, you want to hold your license. Um, and there are fees. Every brokerage has different fees. There are brokers like, um, brokerages like Samson that just charge like desk fees, very nominal. So agents can kind of come in and run their own business. And then there's obviously full service uh, brokerages that will take you on and give you leads and all of that. I think if somebody's just looking to get in and maybe casually uh, in, flip a house, it's not necessary to get it. It's, it's fine, but you have to look if, if that's really going to have a return on investment. Is there, is there, you know, tangible evidence that doing this, whether it's going to, you know, be maybe you're saving on agent fees because you're the agent. So there's some ways to leverage uh, deals where you're not including 
uh, your commission. So that's one benefit. But then there are, you know, tons of agents out there that have investors and wholesalers and these relationships that can get deals in front of you. And, and that's valuable as well. So I think if you're, if you're going to do a high volume of business, if this is really going to be a main source of income for you, then it certainly doesn't hurt because it's really a, it, real estate to me is like education. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's the license to conduct uh, real estate transactions, but it's also a lot of education that comes along with it. So having that perspective in my mind is like having additional information that you might not have otherwise had. And that would, might allow you to negotiate your deals better. That might allow you to uh, finance your deals better because you have a better understanding of it. So there's a bunch of different things I think that, um, that, that can be a benefit, but it's certainly not cheap. It's not like it takes five minutes and you just go in and you're, you know, you, you put in your thing and you're good. It's, it's a, it's a whole process, right? So, um, for anybody who's just casually doing it, I would say you could probably learn a lot and do a lot without going full blown to, you know, agent. And there's, there's re reoccurring fees. You have to keep these things active. There's right. CEC credits. It's not, it's all, it, it might be different if it was just a one and done type of a situation, but that's not the case. So I think people have to really figure out what their strategy is with um, their, their business. And, and if that really warrants the, the time and money and effort to, to, to pursue it. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, I think if, if you're wanting to sell real estate to other people and have that be another income generator and a revenue source for you, then sure, have your real estate license. But if you're if you're just looking to be an investor and and not necessarily you know be on the transaction side, then go connect with a, a realtor like yourself who's familiar with investments and investing and can help you kind of down that road without having to go through the whole process of getting the license yourself. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that I, I always just find that people make, I don't know, they have different, uh, different takes on it. And I think, you know, it's, it's always good to get someone who's actually doing both to see, hear what your, your take on that is. Um, so you're doing so many things, you've got a clothing line, you, you're uh, developing these uh, bottles and how do you make it all work? I mean, it's, you know, people talk a lot about time management and, and the reason to become an entrepreneur is time freedom. And so what is your, how do you fit it all in? How do you kind of make, make things, make your days go? Well, I'm always well aware that I could be better. That's the first thing if, you know, I, I, try hard to manage my time, but it's with being a father and being, you know, and all the things that I have going on, it is, it is tough um, to manage your time. Um, especially when some of these businesses are, you know, is it, if it's just me, that's, that's, it's a lot, it's a lot to handle. So that saying that, you know, entrepreneurs work like 80 hours a week for themselves, so they don't have to work 40 for someone else. It's, yeah. it's sort of that I'll, I, you know, I think the, at the heart of all of it, I love what I do. And, and so for me, the, the careers and the businesses that I'm involved in and have going on right now, it's been one of the first times in my life, I would say that I feel very much in, in a place where I am like in my zone doing what I should be doing, like feeling like I'm, I'm doing my, my calling, right? Going after my calling, my purpose, the, the, the beginning part of, of, you know, so many things that are to come, but, but really following and staying true to, to me as a person, because on those days when it's hard to get up and it's, you know, there's a bunch of things going on and I have to work and do all this. If, if I didn't love what I did, it would be a little bit, it would be much harder, right. To, to, mm -hmm. to get the motivation to do that. So I really keep, uh, you know, two things in my head, uh, that really keep me motivated. Um, that may, may sound a little strange for some people, but, uh, but it's really death and, and my children. And so, you know, those two things, I'm well aware that we have limited time on this planet with what we can do. And I think it's very easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day grind of things and not, um, not recognize how short life actually is. And so, you know, I'm, I don't want to wake up one day and go, man, I wasted all that time, you know, not, not following these things and not uh, working the hardest that I could to really um, set myself up for the life that I, you know, that I envision that I, you know, focus on that I'm trying to manifest um, through these actions. So, so a lot of it is, is a lot of mindset work and really trying to, on a day-to-day -day basis, protect my mindset um, and staying positive and staying, you know, uh, motivated and, and just being in tune with what my goals are, because those are all the things that I think really help hold you up when you're, when you're falling down, when you're tired and when you're, you know, uh, 
upset or when things don't go your way. Um, but I'm so conditioned for failure and so conditioned for obstacles and struggles because of the nature of just these businesses that I've grown over the years and, and, and my life and how it is that it's not that I, that I can just handle it with ease, but I'm much more efficient as, as a human, I'd say at, at handling these things, keeping them in perspective, um, not getting weighed down with the past and being able to move forward. Because when you do that, you're, you're really stunting your growth. You're, you're holding yourself back from being able to move forward when you're, when you're focused on all these things in the past. So this is why I'm justifying not doing this and this, because it, it didn't work in the past. I kind of try to really remove that and uh, <clears throat> just stay, you know, stay focused on, on what the goals are. And some days I win and some days I lose and that's okay too. You know, some days it's great. Some days I wake up and I get all the things done. I'm my diet's on point. My exercise is on point. I, I, I was productive with work. And then some days I'm dragging and I'm tired and I can't think, and I'm, you know, in a bad mood and, um, but that's life. That's kind of how it is. You know, I don't think anybody has an expectation that it's perfect every time, but, um, but I think at the core of it, if you do love what you do, if, if you feel, um, you know, purpose and, uh, then, then that really helps you stay motivated and compartmentalize your time so that you can keep growing. Cause I, I think of where these things are going. And I think every time that I'm not doing what I need to be doing, I think of like, that's one more day that I'm behind where I want to be. It, it might be a little obsessive on, on that front, but you know, when you're not just getting a paycheck every day from some company, you have to hustle. That's what it requires, you know? So, um, to have the luxury of picking up my kids and taking them to school in the morning and doing things like that, you have to hustle. I have to hustle. I have to make sure that, you know, I'm staying on task and growing these companies and I'm um, doing what I need to do. So yeah. that's kind of, um, yeah, hundred percent agree. And I think that the, that's, all of those points are it's right. Like the, the, the ability to do all of these things and have, and be an entrepreneur and all of that, it comes from the passion for those projects, right? It's, it's not, it's probably not easy to be an entrepreneur to do something you don't want to do. Right. That's, that's when it becomes just a job. But when you have that passion for what you're doing, you really believe in it, then the energy and the motivation and all of that sort of come a little bit, maybe easier and then this is a perfect transition because we <laughs> get to the part where it sort of asks you the, the questions in the show. But the, the next thing that I think is, you know, for those days where, you know, you know, your exercise, your diet, all that you, stuff you mentioned is not on point, you're not feeling the motivation, then you throw in your why. So your reason for, for pushing. So what is your why? That, that's first, first of the questions I ask every guest. So what is your why, Matthew? I really want to inspire other people, other entrepreneurs to take big risks and take big actions and, and pursue their goals. Because again, I see and know a lot of people who are successful on paper, they make a lot of money, but they're not happy people. They're not, they're, you know, they live for the weekends, they, they're subservient to corporate life and their, you know, their businesses. And, and they're, this is not to denounce corporate America and, and say, though, it's terrible to have a normal nine to five. I mean, like at all, it, this is a personal thing, you know, for, for me and just where I feel I fit in, in this, in this world. But, um, I really want to inspire people because I think a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the books, a lot of the, the people that came before me that are, you know, some of the most successful people in the world inspired me through their stories and their journeys of like torment and failure and bankruptcy and all these things that they went through. So I really, through all of that, I started to recognize that so often it wasn't that the people that succeeded were the smartest people in the room. They were just the ones willing to work the hardest and persevere. They were the ones that didn't quit, that didn't allow one failure to stop them from moving forward. So, um, so for me, I want to leave a legacy. I want, I want to be able to have the, the platform to, positively, hopefully influence people um, and give them the same type of motivation and maybe uh, reassurance through my journey and, and my struggles that maybe provides them comfort to, to keep going, right? Because it's very easy to quit. And there's a lot of people out there that if they did, the world would be a different place. The 
products that wouldn't exist, companies that wouldn't exist, things that we use that we don't even think about, that if those people didn't go through hell and back to, to make that happen, we wouldn't have those things. And so while I don't want to at all put myself in some category like Apple or I'm Elon Musk and changing the world, I just think in in with with my skill set, uh, I tend to be a good teacher and I, and I tend to be able to inspire people through, through stories and through situations. So my goal would be to hopefully get these businesses successful to a point that I am warranted the platform to be able to speak to people in masses and be able to hopefully, you know, positively influence them and, and help them through these struggles because life is so much bigger than just us as people, you know, there's so many, there's so many things that you can do to positively impact the world. And so for me, if I look at the, the things that I've been given, uh, the skill sets that I have, I think those are some of the best things that I can do to give back, um, as just a debt of gratitude for, you know, my life and, and, and where it is and, and kind of the trajectory at this point. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I think your, your point about, you know, the, the people that, uh, if they had quit, would be, you know, we, we, we as a whole would be <laughs> in a worse place. I mean, it's just to think about some of those. And it's like, you brought up Apple, you brought up, you brought up Elon Musk. I mean, those are things that, sure, could we live without Apple products? Technically, yes, but most people don't. Most people don't live without Apple products. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, <laughs> say it's, it's like Elon Musk, like he, he, they don't, they don't do these projects because they think, I want to be the richest man in the world. That's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to, nobody could have thought that when Elon Musk started Tesla, like maybe Elon Musk thought it, but nobody, nobody else was like, yeah, this, this is going to be amazing. And this guy's going to end up being the richest man in the world. It, it, and it's just, it, it, that's not what it's about. It's an, and I, and that, and I never get, you know, I never once have I asked someone on the show, what is your why? And they're like, I just want a pile of money. Like nobody, nobody answers that way because that's not, that's not the case. That's, it's like, sure, money's helpful. It's a great tool, but it's, that's not really why people are doing this stuff. It's, it's to provide, uh, you know, positivity and, and, and service to the world. And so it, it's kind of, it's really cool to, to think about that and think about, you know, I'm sure there's lots of days in Elon Musk's life that he has, not felt like putting in the work and he still does. And that's, it's just, it, it's just pushing through. So um, very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ne next question for you, Matthews, what is, uh, what is something about yourself that uh, maybe isn't common knowledge that people would be surprised to know? Hmm. Let's see. I cry a lot in movies. I'm like a huge baby with movies, very emotional guy. I don't know, like a dog that like I, I do a lot of those, like sitting back, I got some in my contact soup, <laughs> probably yeah. like one of the more emotional human beings that I, that I know. Um, and which is contrary to like me, who's fought MMA and done jujitsu and all those things, but, uh, yeah, very emotional. And I, uh, I am a, a huge fan of baking cakes, all this, you know, like baking, which maybe leans on a feminine side a little bit, but I just, I enjoy it. I, I think because of the artistic side of it, like cooking and baking and creating these things, I've always justified it in my head, felt like it's, it's sort of in that vein of, of creative, you know, creativeness. And so maybe that's what kind of draws me to it and eating. I enjoy. So, you know, it kind of, <laughs> it kind it of does go out. hand in hand. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you can make yourself something delicious that benefits you. Yeah. That's funny. My, my, uh, my trainer uh, also bakes and he's like, a very big guy, just like you wouldn't, you wouldn't look at him and think that, but <laughs> we're closet uh, he's, bakers. He's quite a good baker. So it's funny that, uh, that, that similarity there. Yeah. Um, when people hear this, uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you and get in touch? Um, usually Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, is probably the best. I would say I spend the most time on Instagram, um, with the various accounts, because that's where I get to interact with people the most. And so, you know, that I would say 99% of the time, that's the best place to, to find me. Okay, perfect. And we'll, uh, we can put that in the, in the um, show notes as well, your Instagram. Um, final question for you. What advice would you give to someone who is, you know, maybe a few years back in their journey uh, they haven't kind of established themselves yet. They're, they're looking to get started and, and kind of, whether that's 
as an entrepreneur, as a, as a realtor, as an investor, whatever you, whatever angle you want to take on it, what, what advice would you give? I think one thing to really be hyper aware of is that information and being a good learner, being specifically being a quick learner, um, is definitely a, a, a wonderful life skill to have. Um, anything that you want to pursue. Now we're in a, we're at a point where I think we're in one of the most opportunistic times in, in all of human history with YouTube. And I mean, you can really like, you can put almost any topic in and probably 4,000 videos on YouTube come up. So whatever it is that you want to do now is a really bad time to make excuses about why you can't do something. Um, but I think at the core of that, you know, I've talked to people and said, and ask them before, hey, if you could, if you could design your life to be anything you want, how, what would that look like? Like, walk me through a day in your life, and what, what would that look like when you get up to when you go to bed? And I was always surprised at the responses I would get from people because a majority of them really had no way to articulate what that is that they wanted their life to look like. They actually didn't know what career, what the, you know how their day, where they would live, where they would be, any of that. And so to me, I was always like, you know, this is, this is something that you really need to uh, focus on in the beginning, because this, this starts your entire journey, right? Like if you don't know where you're going, it's like driving without a map, you're just kind of walking through. And what happens when you do that, you end up becoming susceptible to things like taking jobs just for money, right? Like not getting into a job for the money is the right thing to do. However, how many people do you know that I know that are in, you know, they might be in a tough financial situation. They have to do what they have to do to make money. Like that is a very real thing that just happens. And that I think strays a lot of people from, you know, they divert from, from using that as sort of their long-term excuse of why they can't pursue their, their goals is because of, you know, financial reasons. I have to do this. I have to do that. You always have to figure out a way to, to, to navigate around, um, you know, financial issues. Uh, but if in the background, you're working towards what your actual goal is, you're working towards the thing that you, whether it's taking night classes or starting a business on the side, you know, the point is that you're not letting go of that dream just because you have to make money. Now we have different seasons of life where we need to make money and we're, we're, you know, things suck financially and then they're better and then they suck again. And that's just the, the kind of the way it goes. So, for people that are wanting to be an entrepreneur, I think first under really understanding what it is that they want their life to look like. It's much easier to design your life here and then logically write out the steps and work backwards to how to get there than to take this audacious goal of I want to be this and then just have no clue how to even get there. So you really have to, I think, you know, figure out what your short term and long term plan is, whether it's with the business, being an entrepreneur, going out on your own. Uh, and then be willing to put in just the work to make it happen. And it, and it's, and it's going to require sacrifice and discipline, discipline at the heart of everything is, is ends up being kind of the X factor, whether it's getting in shape, you know, it, does somebody stay disciplined long enough to watch their diet and go to the gym to get their results? Do they say disciplined enough to do the work in their business to get it to six figures where it can take care of them? You know, all of those things are predicated on, on discipline. So, um, when you love what you're doing, when you're, when you feel like you have this thing that is something that means something to you, I find that you'll probably be more willing to put in that work. And so, you know, read every book that you can become an expert at it. Like, you know, don't just getting into something and being okay is unacceptable, you know, go as, as an entrepreneur, go in with the mindset of wanting to be the best and, and, embrace all of the, the knowledge and, and retain all of the knowledge that you can constantly read and, and become an expert in your field because you as a person will be more confident. You're going to be more competent. You know, you're going to have more opportunities because other people are also going to recognize that you know what you're talking about. Uh, and, and that will have value and that, that knowledge and your skill sets equals value and, and which equals how much money you are made. You know, that's the way of the world value and, and, and what you get out of that, um, and, and what you're willing to give. So, um, so get good with, with learning and reading and, uh, studying and be okay with failure because you're going to have a lot of it along the way. Um, but, but recognizing that failure is such a, it's such a normal part of every business. Like, I don't know anybody, my partner who is 
extremely wealthy and has 13 companies and is an amazing human being and the stories of his failures and, and financial issues. I mean, he has a laundry list of them. They, I've, I've never met anybody who's really successful that just skated their way through perfectly without any, you know, a- any turmoil and issues. It just almost never happens. Like maybe the lottery winners, Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, the lottery winners just go bankrupt after. A few yeah. Years. They end they up doing drugs and killing themselves or yeah, going they, nuts afterwards. Yeah. I don't so know it's what to do with that money. So <laughs> it's, yeah, no, it's, it's a, uh, I mean, very valid points and, and good, good piece of advice. And I think that it's, I think, you know, the, I think people don't, the point about not having a, not knowing what you want your perfect day to look like is because people are afraid to, afraid to dream that. They're afraid to, because, and it's probably because they know in their heart that it, is going to take a lot of work and sacrifice and commitment, like you said. So it's kind of like, well, I don't want to think about that because I don't want to do the steps that are going to get me there. But it's, there's, there's no, there's no reason to say that you can't because plenty of people have, and plenty of people have been in a worse scenario and dug themselves out and, and come out on the other end, very successful. So it's kind of, it's just a matter of, of how bad you want it. And it's okay if you don't, but, but you can't say that it's not doable. I think it's really, that's, that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, as an example with Epic Roll, did I know how to run a clothing company or start a clothing company or set up, you know, a Shopify website and do, I had no clue. I had to spend hours and figuring it out and go through and, you know, nobody told me here's how to invent a product and bring it to market and dealing with, uh, you know, patent attorneys and I mean, it's just, there's so much and you just, you have to either accept that like, you know, getting mentors is fantastic. I think that's a really valuable thing. Um, and that's, it's a very undervalued thing too, I, as well. Cause I talked to a lot of people that just never even thought like, Hey, maybe, <laughs> maybe finding somebody who's in the position or doing what you want to do is a great person to talk to, you know, help yeah. avoid some of the common mistakes. So, um, the information is out there. You have to, but you have to, you have to seek it out. So you can't sit back and just say, I, I don't know, or I don't, you know, if you do that, it will be a very long, hard road for you to becoming an entrepreneur because you're not, we're not owed anything. We, 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 this entitlement that, you know, is it, it shouldn't exist. It's you have to work for what you get in life um, and be resourceful and seek out that information. If you are willing to do that, you will be successful. A hundred percent. I believe that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, well, listen, this was, this was great. Uh, thank you for, for coming on the show today. I appreciate your time and, and really kind of, uh, I love, you know, hearing your mindset and, you know, you have a lot of positivity and, uh, good advice to people that are, you know, really trying to, trying to make it a, a very good example. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll go ahead and sign off. Have a good day, everyone. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.